From a young age, Congressman John Lewis took a stand for civil rights. Along with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., he spoke at the historic March on Washington in 1963. Congressman Lewis was just 23 years old at the time. John Lewis was elected to Congress in November 1986 and has served as U.S. Representative of Georgia's 5th Congressional District since that time. We are honored that Congressman Lewis has joined us in celebrating Constitution Day. He provides a wonderful introduction to the Constitution Day episode of our online video lesson, Constitution Hall Pass, which I encourage you to check out at constitutioncenter.org forward slash Constitution Day. And now we have the honor of hearing more about March, Book One, the first in a graphic novel trilogy that shares Congressman Lewis's remarkable story with new generations. Book One spans Lewis's youth in rural Alabama, his life-changing meeting with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the birth of the Nashville student movement, and their fight against segregation through nonviolent activism. Congressman Lewis drew inspiration from the 1958 comic book Martin Luther King and the Montgomery Story, which inspired him to create his own illustrated memoir. In just a few moments, we'll hear from Congressman Lewis, followed by his co-author, Andrew Iden. After they speak, National Constitution Center President and CEO Jeffrey Rosen will join them on stage to ask a few questions. And at the conclusion of the program, you are invited to join Congressman Lewis and Mr. Iden upstairs in our Bogle Chairman's Room for a special book signing. And now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming civil rights pioneer Congressman John Lewis, Andrew Iden, and President and CEO of the Constitution Center, Jeffrey Rosen. Good afternoon. I'm delighted, very happy, and very pleased to be here at Constitution Center on Constitution Day. To be here in Philadelphia to see each and every one of you. To be here with my co-author, Andrew Iden to tell you that I didn't grow up in a big city like Philadelphia or New York or Buffalo or Detroit or Atlanta or Washington, D.C. You heard in the introduction that I grew up on a farm in rural Alabama about 50 miles from Montgomery outside of a little place called Troy. It is true that my father was a sharecropper, a tenny farmer. But back in 1944, when I was only four years old, and I do remember when I was four. How many of you remember when you were four? <laughs> now, what happened to the rest of us? <laughs> my father had saved $300, and with the $300, he bought 110 acres of land. My family still owned this land. And on this farm, we raised a lot of cotton and corn, peanuts, hogs, cows, and chickens. On the farm, it was my responsibility to care for the chickens. And I fell in love with raising chickens like no one else could raise chickens. I know some of you as young people, you know about Popeyes. You know Chick-fil-A, Kentucky Fry, churches maybe, Bojinga maybe. But you don't any, know anything about raising chickens, right? Any of you know anything about raising chickens? Don't fool me, you don't know anything about raising chickens. <laughs> well, as a little boy, I became very good at raising chickens, and to tell the chicken story, it's a little too long. It would take all of my time. But as a young child, as a little boy, I wanted to be a minister. I wanted to preach the gospel. So from time to time, with the help of my brothers and sisters and my cousins, we would gather all of our chickens together in the chicken yard 
And book one of March tell the story. And we would have church. I would start preaching. And some of these chicken would bow their heads. Some of these chicken would shake their heads. They never quite said amen. But I'm convinced that some of those chicken that I preached to during the 40s and the 50s tend to listen to me much better than some of my colleagues listen to me today in the Congress. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, some of these chickens were just a little more productive. At least they produce eggs. When we would visit the little town of Troy, visit Tuskegee, visit Montgomery, I saw those signs that said white men, colored men, white women, colored women. As a little child, I tasted the bitter fruits of racism, and I didn't like it. I didn't like seeing those signs. I didn't like when I went to the theater. All of us little black children had to go upstairs to the balcony, and all the little white children went downstairs to the first floor. I would come home and ask my mother, my father, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, why? They would say, that's the way it is. Don't get in the way, don't get in trouble. But one day in 1955, 15 years old, in the 10th grade, I heard about Rosa Parks. I heard the words of Martin Luther King Jr. on old radio. The action of Rosa Parks, the words and leadership of Martin Luther King Jr. inspired me to find a way to get in the way. And I got in trouble, good trouble, necessary trouble. As a student in college, we studied the way of peace, the way of love, the way of nonviolence. We studied what Gandhi attempted to do in South Africa, what he accomplished in India. We studied the role in civil disobedience. We studied the great religions of the world. And Andrew Eiden will tell you in book one, March book one, we start sitting in, black and white college students, black and white high school students. We sitting there in an orderly, peaceful, nonviolent fashion we didn't to be served, and someone would come up and spit on us. They put a lighted cigarette out in our hair or down our backs, pour hot water, hot coffee, or hot chocolate on us. Pull us off the lunch kind of stools. We were orderly, peaceful. Many of us accepted nonviolence as a way of life, as a way of living. But we were charged with disorderly conduct, disturbing the peace. We got arrested. I went to jail the first time on February 27, 1960. Between 1960 and 1966, I was arrested and jailed 40 times for sitting in, for going on a freedom ride, marching for the right to vote, Beaten at a Greyhound bus station in South Carolina. Beaten at the Greyhound bus station in Montgomery, Alabama, and left bloody and unconscious. Beaten, having a concussion on that bridge in Selma, Alabama, on March 7, 1965, a day that became known as Bloody Sunday. But I never became bitter or hostile. I never gave up. I never gave in. I kept the faith, and during all these many years, I've tried to keep my eyes on the prize. March, book one, tell a story of a group of people who stood up together, rested together, beaten together, and jailed together. Some of my friends didn't make it. They died. Today, this year, we celebrated, just a few weeks ago, the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington. Back in 1963, August 28, 1963, I was the youngest speaker 
to march on Washington. And out of the 10 people that spoke that day, I'm the only one still around. So as we write book two and book three, we will tell the whole story, the complete story of a people, of a struggle to make America different, to make America better, and create what we call one people, one family, one house. Because in America, we all live in the same house, the American house. And it doesn't matter whether we are black or white, Latino or Asian American or Native American. On this little planet, this little spaceship that we call Earth, we must learn to live together, as Dr. King was there. But we will perish as fools. Can I give up? Can I give in? Can I become bitter or hostile? We have to march on with hope, with faith, and with love. Thank you very, very much. And now, my colleague and my friend, my co-author, Andrew Iden. My name is Andrew Iden. I uh, work on the congressman's staff in Washington, and I had the opportunity to write these graphic novels with him. Um, I guess to those of you closer to me, I am the guy who's trying to get a comic book into your classroom. Um, I think you might enjoy it. I was a comic book fan when I was a kid. Um, the first comic book I ever read was Uncanny X-Men 317. It had a lenticular cover, which was sort of like a reflective prism. And uh, it talked about the, the young mutants being accepted by the older mutants. And I could really identify with that when I was like nine years old because, you know, you're starting to play baseball, you're starting to get into these things, and the older kids are sort of pushing you around, you're a little bit smaller, you're, you're, you're not quite as fast, uh, you don't quite know as much. And there, there were people who were trying to help them, trying to help educate them, trying to help them find their way. Um, and as a kid, as I grew up and I, and I read more and more comics, I, I really became attracted to the idea of justice being done by, by those who, who had the power, but not necessarily obligation. They did it out of a sense of um, righteousness, helping those who couldn't help themselves. Um, where this story began for me, with March, book one, was on the congressman's campaign in 2008. I was working as his press secretary. And it was coming to the end of the campaign. And they said, uh, what are you doing afterwards? And I, I told the truth. I said, I'm going to a comic book convention. <laughs> and in professional politics, that gets you every look you can imagine it, it would get you. But um, I was unafraid. I was someone who wore it with a badge, as if it was a badge of honor. And uh, they were teasing a little bit. And the congressman said, no, no, don't laugh. There was a comic book during the movement. And it was incredibly influential. And I was captivated by that idea. Something as significant to American history as the civil rights movement. Partially inspired by something as simple as a 14-page comic book. It was called Martin Luther King and the Montgomery Story. And if you read March, there's a very brief mention somewhere in the middle. The young man right down front's almost there. <laughs> Which, I mean, I'm going to pause here for a moment and say, how many times have you had someone of John Lewis's stature come in with a book and the kids are reading it right there in front? <laughs> That's why we're doing this. Okay? So I learned about Martin Luther King and the Montgomery story and this idea that it could be influential. And I was 24 years old and I didn't know any better. And I started asking Congressman Lewis, why don't you write a comic book? That small comic just told the story of the Montgomery bus boycotts. But in my time working for Congressman Lewis, I had heard him tell so many stories about the movement that he himself lived that had important lessons that we could apply today. Most importantly, that of nonviolence. 
There is too much violence in our community today. I live in Washington. It was not more than two miles from my house that more than a dozen people lost their lives yesterday. There are guns in communities. There are guns in schools. There's bullying, there's violence among our peers, our friends, people we love, people we respect. And today, I think y'all down in front may not see nonviolence as an option. You might not really know what it is. It's a way out, just as it was for John Lewis in 1959. It's a way out today. There are things that you may totally object to. You may think your children, or your, your teachers are doing the wrong thing. You may think your community is doing the wrong thing. And you know what? It's okay to disagree with them. John Lewis disagreed with, his, with those who are older than him. But you can use nonviolence and the discipline that you'll read about in March to change that, to speak up, to speak out, to get in the way cause a little bit of trouble, good trouble, necessary trouble. And what we're trying to do is to show you all of the lessons from the Civil Rights Movement as John Lewis experienced it, in a way that hopefully is a little bit easier to digest, a little bit more pleasurable, but also that gives it an added dimension of art. Literature is art, but we're bringing in a whole other way of doing it. And we're just starting to see graphic novels in schools. You've seen maybe Mouse, Persepolis, some of Joe Sacco's work. But never before has a primary figure from history taken the time to sit down and write his own graphic memoir. So I hope what this creates for you is an opportunity. Go to your teachers, say you'd rather read a graphic novel, and it'll be there for them. But more importantly, I hope you read it and learn about nonviolence. Because that's your way out. You have an obligation to make this world a better place. But sometimes they don't necessarily tell you how to do that. They don't give you the tools. And we're trying to make it just a little bit easier to do that. So I hope you enjoy it. I hope you read it. Y'all almost done. <laughs> and um, we've got two more. There's a lot of lessons in this movement. There's a lot of things we've forgotten. You know, you see the Supreme Court making moves today that baffle the imagination. That show that they too have forgotten how far we've come and what had to be given to achieve that. And so, whether you're a parent in the back or a kid in the front, Pass it around. Show it to people. Remind them that there is another way. And don't be afraid to get in the way. Thank you. Congressman Lewis, Andrew Aiden, we could not be more honored to welcome you to the National Constitution Center on Constitution Day. Uh, Congressman Lewis, on the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington, uh, for you to spend your time with us here uh, is more uh, meaningful than I can possibly say. I just had the extraordinary experience about an hour ago of watching Congressman Lewis uh, with a young 10th grader from New York City induct into the national tree that is in our permanent exhibition, the National Tree of Honor, uh, Congressman Hiram Rhodes, the first African-American senator. He was inducted because this young man wrote an essay that was so persuasive uh, that it was chosen among thousands of essays. And Congressman Lewis is very much the heir to uh, Senator Rhodes. Uh, there's no greater American in terms of contributions to civil rights, and we're just honored you're here. In addition to that, I mean, that, that, that sort of uh, goes without saying. Everyone knows about the Congressman's extraordinary contributions to civil rights. But on top of that, You've written a riveting book. 
uh, both of you, it, it's not a coincidence that those young men in the first row are, can't put it down uh, during our talk. I had the most important test uh, of all uh, on this score. I took the book home over the weekend and uh, was sitting on the kitchen table and my seven-year-old picked it up. And he couldn't put it down. He read it straight through and then he read it again and then he said, Daddy, when is book two coming out? <laughs> this book is a page turner. But it's not only for kids. I read it and I was riveted by it too. And there's something, you're right, Andrew, there's something about the form, this graphic novel form, married to history that is co incredibly compelling and uh, I think is really a path-breaking way of teaching history to uh, students of all ages. The obvious first question I have to ask Congressman is because as Andrew said, this, uh, much of your work in the civil rights movement was inspired by a comic book, this 1958 comic book, Martin Luther King and the Montgomery Story. How did this graphic book inspire you? What was it about it? And was there something specific about the graphic comic book form that galvanized you in 1958? Well, as I stated earlier, I had heard about Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks, I read about him in the newspaper, heard Dr. King's voice on the radio, but picking up the comic book made it real, the, the drawing, the illustration, and I could almost see myself there, uh, not getting on a bus going to a mass rally, being there in support of that effort. I, I, I was so inspired a, as a student in, in, in college reading Martin Luther King Jr. and the Montgomery story that it said to me, I too can do something. I heard Dr. King really speaking from those pages, saying, John Lewis, John Robert Lewis, you too can make a contribution. You too can get involved. And when I had a chance, I got involved. I gave it all that I had. And with the comic book, with the illustration, you can feel it. You can almost smell the action, almost taste the action. You want to be part of it. You want to be there. You want to be in the midst of the struggle, in the midst of the fight. Some of the many powerful parts of the book uh, are, are its description of nonviolence, about how you're sitting at lunch counters and you're being beaten and you're not resorting to violence to respond. What was that like and what did that teach you about activism? Well, we had what we call role playing, a uh, social drama, where you would have white and African American young people or students playing the role of each other. And you go through the action of uh, 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 someone calling you out of your name, uh, 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 someone um, appearing to be just really downright mean to you. But you had to accept it. You had to look at it and smile. We, in, 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 in the comic book of Dr. King, similar to Mart, we saw it may real the do's and don't. We, we have him march, sit up straight. Don't talk back. Make eye contact. Obey your leader. But whatever you do, remember the teaching of the great teacher. Remember the teaching of Gandhi. Remember the teaching of Martin Luther King Jr. You were describing to me a remarkable story about how one of the men who beat you later came to apologize. Tell me about that. Well, on May 9, 1961, during the Freedom Rides, the same year that President Barack Obama was born, my seatmate, a, a white gentleman from Connecticut, the two of us had boarded a Greyhound bus in Washington, D.C. Back in 1961, black people and white people couldn't be seated together leaving Washington, D.C., traveling through Virginia, through North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, to Louisiana. We were on our way to New Orleans. When we arrived in Rock Hill, South Carolina, only about 35 miles from Charlotte, North Carolina, we got off the bus and attempted to enter a so-called white waiting room. It was marked white waiting. And the moment we started through the door, 
a group of young white men attacked us and left us bloody in the doorway of this waiting room. The local police officials came up and wanted to know whether we wanted to press charges. We said no. We come with love and peace and nonviolence. Many years later, to be exact, in February of 09, less than a month after President Obama had been inaugurated, the same one of the same men, about my age, and his son came to my office in Washington. His son had been encouraging his father to seek out the people that he had wronged. And he said, Mr. Lewis, or Congressman Lewis, I wonder the individual that beat you. I want to apologize. Will you forgive me? His son started crying. He started crying. I said, yes, I accept your apology. I forgive you. The two of them gave me a hug. I hugged them back, and I started crying. It tended to demonstrate the power of the way of love, the way of nonviolence. And after that, I saw this gentleman three other times. Oprah had us all on, on one of her last shows when she was on network. She had about, during the summer of 1961, almost 400 of us were arrested and went to jail, black and white, men and women, ministers, teachers, lawyers, and doctors for going on the freedom rides. But it led to the desegregation of public transportation all across the American South. Those signs came tumbling down, and they are gone, and they will not return. You describe in the book a remarkable encounter with Thurgood Marshall, the great lawyer who argued Brown versus Board of Education and the future Supreme Court justice. And he was arguing for more pragmatic compromise, for going slower. And you felt that you wanted to go faster. Tell us about that. Well, I remember uh, meeting Mr. Marshall on, on a few occasions. He was a wonderful lawyer. People would say in the South, Thurgood Marshall is coming into town. And uh, when you knew uh, heard that Thurgood Marshall was coming to town, or coming to speak at a rally, this great lawyer. And it was during the summer of 1961 when I had an opportunity to talk with him. He said, in effect, John, you all need to stop sitting in and going on those freedom rides. It doesn't make sense for you to continue to get arrested and go to jail and get beaten. So we can take one case to the United States Supreme Court, and we can solve the problem. And I said, Mr. Marshall, uh, that's too slow. Uh, we need a mass movement where hundreds and thousands of people can participate. We've taken a case to the court here and there. Just a few lawyers involved. So whether it was the Freedom Rides or the sit-ins or the marches, hundreds and thousands of people can participate. And we can hasten the end of segregation and racial discrimination and bring down those signs. And they came down. In his book, The Audacity of Hope, President Obama says that the civil rights movement and the marches did more to advance civil rights than the judicial decisions. Is that, is that an important lesson? Well, I, I think it's, it's a, a, a great lesson because the sit-ins, the freedom ride, the marches made it plain, made it simple that Americans could see by way of television, reading in the newspaper, the pictures in the magazines, and papers. They could see how people were being treated. They saw these well-dressed young people sitting in, going on a freedom ride. They, they, they saw people being chased by police dogs, or trampled by horses, being backed by fire hoses. And the American people didn't like that. And they demanded of the Congress and the President of the United States to act. And they did act. And I said, we, 
we ended not only legal segregation, but we wrote down the signs, and as I continue to say, the only places our children would see those signs today would be in a museum, in a book, on a video. They're gone and they will not return. And America is better today because of what Dr. King did. Sometimes I have the feeling if Dr. King hadn't preached the way of peace, the way of love, the way of nonviolence, if we hadn't committed ourselves, America would be a different America. And I think today we are better America and we are better people because we use the way of peace, the way of love, the way of nonviolence. Was there a turning point in the movement? You mentioned those pictures of the police dogs which galvanized America. Was there an image or a moment when America turned? When we met, when we met with President Kennedy in June of 1963, there was such a sense of righteous indignation in America. Because people had witnessed during the spring of 1963 the photographs, the, the, in the papers, the magazine, but they had seen the films, the video. They couldn't take it. They didn't like it. And they wanted action. And, and President Kennedy was moved that he spoke. It gave a major address on June 12, 1963, to the nation. And he talked about the fires of frustration and the sense of discontent. And when we met with him, we said, oh, Mr. President, you got to do something. You must act. And we told him we were going to march on Washington. And I think that was a turning point. And when Dr. King spoke on August 28, 1963, and said he had a dream, a dream in keeping with the American dream, that helped push and push the American people to say to the Congress and say to the President, we need a strong civil rights bill. You said that you can only see those signs now in museums. And I wonder, and maybe this is for Andrew, is there a danger that young people today will only think of these heroic acts as historical uh, acts that occur in museums? And do you need novels like this in order to galvanize young people and make them realize that this is living history that still matters? Absolutely. I think your ceremony earlier highlighted that fact, that you had the first African-American senator from the state of Mississippi in the 1870s. And then we went back. Um, today, I think this book makes two points. It reminds us what, uh, what, was, what was endured during the Civil Rights Movement, what, what sort of planning and tactics and uh, sacrifice went into making that become a reality. And then second, there will be a generation that grows up not knowing what it was like to never have an African-American president. The book is framed around Inauguration Day to help make that point of what that meant to those who sacrificed so much to make it possible. Um, so there's, there's many levels here in which history um, weaves through our own, data, our, our own life, uh, but we don't understand it fully. And hopefully this is a reminder to, to everyone of what was given uh, and, and why it's so important that as we sit here at the Constitution Center, why we exercise those rights, uh, the right to protest, uh, the right to make our voice heard. Now, both of you mentioned the recent Supreme Court decisions involving the Voting Rights Act. The National Constitution Center is a nonpartisan institution. Our congressional mandate is to disseminate information about the U.S. Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. And there are strong arguments on both sides of that in any constitutional case, and we're not going to take sides on that now. But I do want to ask you, Congressman, you devoted your life to achieving political change by passing great congressional statutes like the Civil Rights Act and Voting Rights Act. What is your reaction to the Supreme Court decision, and will it be possible to protect voting rights through other provisions of the, of the Voting Rights Act that have not yet been struck down? Well, the, the day that the Supreme Court decided to change a section of the Voting Rights Act in 1965, I wanted to cry. I, I wanted to cry, but the tears just wouldn't come. It was a very sad day for me and for hundreds and thousands and millions of Americans. Because people sacrificed so much to get the Voting Rights Act passed in 1965 that President Johnson signed into law. And I was there. As a matter of fact, 
The pen that President Johnson gave me was here at the center for several, for several years. It's here right now. All of our audience members can go out and see the very pen mm -hmm. that the congressman saw President Johnson sign the Voting Rights Act at. Well, you know, I gave a little blood on that bridge, almost died on that bridge. And some of my friends and some of my colleagues didn't make it. They died. There were three young men that I knew, Andy Goodman, Mika Scherner, white, from New York City, and a young black man named Jane Shaney from Mississippi, went out Sunday night, June 21st, 1964, to investigate the burning of an African-American church. Many other churches in the South were used for voter registration workshops. And there were other people who marched with us, who was beaten and later died. There were people who stood in unmovable lines there were men who was asked to count the number of bubbles in a bar of soap, the number of jelly beans in a jar. So that's what made it so difficult for me to accept the fact that almost 50 years later, members of the Supreme Court would strike down an important section of the Golden Rights Act. And that's why I said they should come and walk in our shoes. We can fix it, and we will fix it. Both Democrats and Republicans would come together in a bipartisan fashion and fix it. That's great to hear. How, how will it be fixed? What, what, what might Congress pass to fix the decision? Well, we have several members of the House and the Senate working together and hopeful later this year or early next year we would come up with the mechanism for fixing it. Glad, glad to hear it. We need to get this audience upstairs so they can buy and read this wonderful book. So I'm going to end by asking you the question. Uh, well, uh, the first question my seven-year-old had is, when's the next edition coming out? When's book two? Well, it's, we're, we're hopeful we'll make it by November 2014. And just give us a tantalizing preview of the story of the Freedom Rides that are going to be told in book two. The Freedom Ride, I tell you, it is drama. It is, it is drama. It was, you know, I, you heard, I grew up in Alabama, rural Alabama, where it was very dangerous to speak up or to speak out, like Andrew said, to find a way to get in the way. To, to exercise your constitutional right, the right to protest, freedom of assembly, to make some noise. Dr. King was said, the time is always right to protest of what is right. Under the Constitution, you have a right to protest of what is right. For black people and white people back in 1961 to sit together on a bus or to sit together in a waiting room, mark white waiting or colored waiting, it was very dangerous. Your friends, you could be schoolmates. And, and people were beaten. People almost died for participating in the Freedom Ride. We were charged with disorderly conduct, breach of the peace, disturbing the peace. But we were very peaceful. We were orderly. And I give you one example. We were taken place in jail in Mississippi. Now, we all got arrested together, black men and white men, white women and, and black women. But when we get to the prison, get to the jail, we are segregated. They take us down to the state penitentiary at Parchment. And we get out, and the guy says something like, I don't want to use the N word, but he says, in effect, and we will use it in, in the book, because we will make it plain. He said, we have in here that will eat you up or beat you up. Then they line us all of the guys up. I don't know what they did with the women, but they line all of the guys up and said, take off all your clothing. And while you were taking off your clothing at the Mississippi State Penitentiary, they had their guns drawn on us. Then they ordered us to take showers. 
And if guys had any, had a mustache, a beard, any facial hair, you had to shave it off. And then in twos, you go and take a shower together. And an hour or so later, they give you a pair of Mississippi State Penitentiary shorts and an undershirt. You can only take one shower a week. That was the freedom ride. You couldn't write a letter, couldn't read a book, couldn't read a newspaper. And one day someone brought by a copy of the Bible for a religious group. Most of us stayed in jail up to 40 days. We all try to get out within 44 days in order to appeal our cases. So we would tell us. We would make it plain. We would make it clear of what happened and how it happened. Andrew, I don't know what you want to add to that. Um, I was reading the first 45 pages last night. And all I kept thinking was, y'all weren't wearing capes. Y'all weren't wearing fancy outfits other than a dignified suit. But you were more hero than anybody I'd ever seen in a comic book before. 